Voici Clara Soudan avec Écho poétique euh, du manque et de l'abondance, une lecture des vagues de Virginia Woolf. Clara est docteur en philosophie éco-critique, diplômée de l'université d'Edimbourg. Euh, sa thèse, Spells of our inhabiting, transitioning from the spectre of Gnostic, of no, Gnostic, Gnostic, sorry, wow. Gnostic? Gnostic. Gnostic. Gnostic estrangement to a philosophy of entangled overflowing étudie le motif gnostique, gnostique wow, d'une aliénation dualiste du monde et la manière dont il infuse notre rapport à la transition écologique. Pardonnez-moi pour ces bafouillements. Elle y soumet notamment le concept de débordement enraciné comme proposition pour une éco-poétique de la résilience qui va nous permettre d'éclairer les vagues. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me. Oh yeah, of course. Sorry. Is that all right? Okay. Um, okay. So Virginia Woolf's ecological sensitivity culminates in the waves, which brilliantly describes the fluidity of our being in the world and also dissolves the boundaries between organic and social life, between cultural and natural rhythms, as well as the frontiers of our own beings. The waves unfolds Wolf's intuition that everything in the world somehow echoes each other, blurring the boundaries between inside and outside, the me and the not me. The images of nature from the interludes are interwoven throughout the monologues in the form of metaphors, placing the human speakers as embedded within the non-human. These sections interweave the outside and objective nature and the internal subjective humanity until the last page where Bernard, one of the main characters and narrators, surrenders to the sea. Each in their own way, the six characters fantasized a recovered visceral connection to the world across the modern alienation and a state of locked-in consciousness. In this regard, the waves comes as a tale of permeability of sea walls overflowed. I argue that Woolf anticipates in her play poem a collapse of modern dualistic ontology. The waves transcends dualistic frontiers between the natural and the cultural, the individual and the collective, the restless and the permanent. It dives into the modern breach of dualism and collapses its banks. This collapse of dualistic boundaries can be read as a collapse of modern order, sanctioning the interwovenness of life and an ontology of entanglement. In this regard, we can observe striking similarities between Woolf's writing and Alfred North Whitehead's philosophy of process, particularly in their shared belief in a continuous stream of the universe. The waves depict a life both entangled and in movement, in perpetual renewal. So the point here is twofold. Virginia Woolf's is a philosophy of interwovenness, interpenetration and interconnection, And also the life she depicts is fluid, and being is understood as becoming. Many eco-feminist and eco-poetic possibilities arise from Woolf's writings, her work be being in many ways precursory. Crucially, Woolf anticipates contemporary reflec reflections about our entangled being in the world, and how, for instance, different oppressions are related. Her perspective is complex, and embraces tensions, refusing to subsume them. Wolf also anticipates developments in the philosophy and ontology of entanglement that would further be conceptualized in the course of the 20th century by figures such as Gilles Deleuze, Félix Guattari or Bruno Latour, and which will take on a whole new dimension, more radical, palpable and absolutely urgent with the advent of the ecological apocalypse for instance, in reflections around the idea of the Anthropocene, or the Capitalocene, or the Cthulhucene. The Waves tells us a tale of weaving, a tale about the stream of our becoming interwoven with the world and the lives surrounding us. The Waves is a book that Wolf describes as her most mystical work, daring and experimental, 
struggling to approach something hard to capture, something both within and beyond us. Wolf's late works are infused with a sense of holism, of a life overflowing boundaries. The waves both embraces, embraces sorry, and preserves a certain form of mystery, a dark wonder that is kept intact all throughout the book. There is no great revelation in her words, but in, uh, instead some matches struck unexpectedly in the dark. That's her words from the lighthouse. The waves points towards something both overwhelming and escaping, something always withdrawing and retreating, which echoes the Heideggerian withdrawal of being, if anyone's familiar with that concept. She depicts the ocean as a cold mother, both embracing, all-encompassing and cold, unknown, always withdrawing until it puts us back into the world again. So I propose to dive into the ontological reach of Wolf's work and approach the waves as, as an oceanic dance around fullness and emptiness, a perpetual movement of expansion and withdrawal accounting for life's entangled becoming. I organize my presentation in three parts. The first one is about the collapsing boundaries and the dissolution of ontological order. The second one is about the intimacy and entanglement with the world that is depicted in the waves. And lastly, the fullness and the em emptiness, which depicts the world as overflowing. The waves reflects an obsession with overflowing boundaries and with the image of riverbanks. It continuously dissolves binaries, dichotomies, and collapses dualisms in favor of ambiguous tensions, of an evanescent in-betweenness. It is a novel saturated with feelings of fullness and emptiness, with something overwhelming and withdrawing, intimacy and distance, death and the pursuit of life, yearning and fulfillment, and always the relationship between inside and outside. The most obvious of these tensions is that between life and death. The stillness of death is intimately interwoven with the movement of life. At the end of the novel, Bernard achieves a moment of expansion. A wave rises in him, he surges up from the sea of existence. And the movement between life and death is portrayed as a huge wave rising. He says, I quote, My son is born, Percival is dead. I am upheld by pillars, shored up on either side by stark emotions, but which, which is sorrow, which is joy. Other tensions that are crumbled, other dualisms that are abolished, is that between presence and absence. Percival is one of, uh, he's a character that is absent, he's not of one of the narrators, and he dies, and his physical absence is felt as a spiritual presence in the mind of others. His existence connects the dead with the living and brings them close to a sense of inner wholeness. The tension between being and becoming, one might call an overflowing rootedness, in reference to Ginny's famous words, I am rooted, but I flow, rising as a wave, perpetually overflowing the bonds that tie me to the world. Wolf characters are perpetually in search for a fuller existence, a fuller life, a saturation of perceptions in order to absorb all possible experiences. Rhoda, one of the six characters, says, I quote, I desired always to stretch the night and fill it fuller and fuller with dreams. So we find an abundance of perceptions. All senses are saturated and still yearning. The collapse of the binary between outside and inside is most manifest in the character of Rhoda, which many argue was inspired by Virginia Woolf herself. She's the one who depicts most Virginia Woolf. Rhoda's wetness refers to her never forming a proper shell against the world. It is the wetness of the nymph born of the sea but stranded. I quote Rhoda, the nymph of the fountain always wet. Amid these collapsing boundaries, the wave subverts an imperial, 
patriarchal order embodied in the eternal proce procession sorry, and committed to reduce to order anything that would overflow its rigid structures. The ontological entanglement depicted in the novel rises as a subversion of modern imperial order and its ethics of individuation and isolation. This patriarchal order is sustained and infused by a fear of groundlessness, a fear of chaos. Rhoda, for example, describes men's attempts to put a square upon the oblong, that's a recurring image, to draw a pattern out from the chaos. The formal education of the boys is depicted as a shift of focus from the outside world to the individual self, and the sophistication of language is understood as a layer of protection against reality. Bernard separates this world, the realm of words, Bernard is a writer and he's obsessed with stories, from the nonverbal experience, isolating himself from what is outside of it. His need for order, which he shares with Louis, another one of the six characters, carries an ominous underlying tone. It suggests the need for hierarchy, segregation and opposition. Louis feels threatened by spontaneity and chaos. He often repeats, I will reduce you to order. He yearns for a hierarchy he could suzume himself in, an eternal procession to follow and a tradition where he could dissolve. We find several depictions of toxic masculinity and its appeal for characters as Neville, Bernard or Louis in the con comfort of belonging and surrendering to an order. I quote Neville, no sorry, Louis. How majestic is their order, how beautiful is their obedience. If I could follow, if I could be with them, I would sacrifice all I know. This procession of imperial order and patriarchal civilization is also mentioned in Three Guyanese, where Wolf asks, where is this procession leading and do we, the outsiders, want to join? So we find embodied in Lewis a certain idea of roots, of order and guardianship, guardianship sorry, embodied in traditions. And then he says, I quote, yet after all, the problem remains. I see wild birds and impulses wilder than the wildest birds strike from my, my wild heart. So even Louis, who is so drawn to tradition and order, feels the submerging intuition of a chained beast, of violent waves rising which even imperial civilization and ancient traditions could not contain. There is something wild, untamed, that perpetually overflows all order, all ancient and immovable that it might be. So which leads me to my second point, but the ontological entanglement and the dissolution of identity, the interpenetration and the permeability of the characters with the world and with each other. The novel presents a chorus of multiple embodied voices whose, whose lives sorry, are entangled, as indivisible as the ocean. The characters are permeable to each other, interwoven with their surroundings. In the intimate encounter with what is outside themselves, the outlines of their beings get blurred. Neville says that love, I quote, makes knots and love tears them apart. So their identities, one which we could describe as kaleidoscopic. The six characters of the novel embody different facets of consciousness, which illuminates a sense of continuity and interdependence between them. Bernard speaks of a many-faceted flower and says later on, I quote, my being only glitters when all its facets are exposed to many people. The characters' identities are dissolved and the entanglement blurs the, ed the edges of their selves. Neville, Neville says at the point, I quote, to have oneself adulterated, mixed up, become part of another, as he, Bernard, approaches, I become not myself, but Neville, mixed with somebody. Later on, he says, I'm not, I am not one person, I am many people, and I do not altogether know who I am. So this radical ontological entanglement amounts to a collapse of the boundaries between self and world. Susan says, 
I think I am the field, I am the barn, I am the trees. All are mine. I cannot be divided or kept apart. Then Louis says again, I feel myself woven in and out of the long summers and winters that have made the corn flow and have frozen streams. I find in the waves an obsession to cross over an overwhelming sense of distance and alienation, a yearning to bridge a gulf. Wolf really strives to articulate the complexities of the liminal, some kind of estranged intimacy between the characters and the world that is both perilous and marvelous. Neville asks often, how bridge the distance between us? Despite this yearning for connection, there seems to remain hidden in a darkness of intimacy, something that eludes, something that resists and escapes. So that crucially, from this ontological entanglement of identity, something always overflows. A beautiful passage, my favorite, in fact, where Neville says to Bernard, as if to save him from dissolving himself into other past selves of brilliant poets, as if awakening him back to his own uniqueness. I quote, You have been reading Byron. You have been marking the passages that seem to approve of your own character. Yet Byron never made tea as you do, who filled the pot so that when you put the lid on, the tea spills over. That is not Byron, that is you. The tea spills over. And that's a beautiful image for Bernard's entangled identity and multi multiple rootedness that overflows. Bernard is more than Byron. He is Byron and more. So all entangled, all blurred that we are, emerging from the world, there remains something irreducible and unique about our experience of life. We could approach this entangled overflowing as a kind of love story with the world, a story of mutual love and creation. Rhoda says, I will give, I will enrich, I will return to the world this beauty. Bernard and Neville's friendship can also be seen as one of loving co-creation. Bernard says to Neville, let me then create you, you have done as much for me. Later on, they bring me into existence as certainly as you do. I am made and remade continually. Different people drew different words for me. So life, and this is my last point, is depicted as something evanescent and flowing. There's a liquidity in the entangled becoming of the characters. Wolf's play poem depicts a continuous stream, and a stream of becoming unfolds in a perpetual movement of, with of withdrawal and overflowing, an oceanic dance around fullness and emptiness. Characters struggle to assemble themselves, to ever feel complete in their lives and in their relationships to each other. They are perpetually on a quest for a fuller existence, a saturation of perceptions in order to absorb all possible experiences. So their senses are both saturated, overwhelmed by waves of sensations, and still they are inhabited by an emptiness that feeds a deep yearning. This yearning, embedded in a twofold movement of withdrawal and overflowing, emerges as a creative tension, which in many ways echoes the Whiteheadian movement of prehension. This concept describes the fact that perception always incorporates elements of the thing that is perceived. Therefore, perception is always creative, so that the characters are always unfolding and perpetually emerging. The question arising is now how to dwell in this oceanic world of entangled emergence, of perpetual withdrawal and overflowing. Someone like Donna Haraway will advise us to stay with the trouble of this fiery, tumultuous and entangled becoming. The waves depict some organic death, an imminent and chaotic force unfolding in and in, in despite the characters, waving towards something primordial, wild and subterranean. I will conclude with a quote from the process philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, which I um, compared and approached to Virginia Woolf. He writes, philosophy begins in wonder, and at the end when philosophic thought has done its best, the wonder remains. I suggest that this is what Virginia Woolf does in the waves, as she brilliantly gets closer to something simultaneously thirsty and overflowing. 
this, I quote, wild beast stamping on the beach. Thank you for your attention.